Hi everyone. Well, here we are live again on Facebook. And you know, in yesterday's virtual story time, I realized that you could see a little bit of kind of a green edge at the bottom of the screen. And I think that was from the little um, phone holder that I'm using. I think I had it in front of the camera. And so hopefully today I have it set back upright and you can't see that little green edge of light and all you see is the video. Well, just a couple of minutes ago, just outside my window, my neighbor was outside using a leaf blower and he's doing a little yard work, but I don't hear it at the moment. So I think that we're okay, but you might hear it start up again. You know, I don't know what the weather is like where you are, but today is April 1st, April Fool's Day, and it's really nice, really nice here in Colorado. It's beautiful, it's sunny, it's warm, but you know, there's one thing you can always predict about Colorado weather, it's going to change. <laughs> so tomorrow we have snow in the forecast, which feels a little crazy if you were to step outside today because it's absolutely beautiful. Well, I hope that you're keeping well and you're keeping healthy and that you're keeping safe. And as we spend this time indoors, um, I'm looking forward to reading more of our story with you. We're going to read the fourth chapter in our book, Mary Jones and Her Bible. And as we've been doing, I just want to talk to you for a couple minutes before we start the story. So during this time where we've all been asked to stay at home, I've been thinking more than even usual about the people that I care about, the people that I love. And I imagine that you probably have been too. You've been thinking about how um, everybody in your family is doing, if everyone's staying healthy, and how your friends are. And maybe you've thought of different unique ways to reach out and share with people that you care about, um, to share that love that you have for them. So I thought about Discovery Mountain and the families that we have in Discovery Mountain and then a lot of the voice actors and the volunteers that we have, they're a part of my family too. So I was thinking about Discovery Mountain and the families we have there. Well, Jamie and Dr. Simon, that's a nice family relationship that they have there, isn't it? We first met Jamie and Dr. Simon and Gadget when they moved up to Discovery Mountain in season one. And we didn't know yet about Natasha. She came later, Jamie's sister. But I really like the 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 closeness that Jamie and her mom have on the program. And as you know, of course, Jamie is my real life daughter. And so I have a special bond with her, of course. And if you haven't gotten to know Naomi, who plays Jamie in real life, there's a mini adventure where you can listen to a whole interview with her and it's called Get to Know Jamie. And you can find that under our minis for 2019 and it's episode eight of the 2019 minis. If you wanna to get to know a little more about Naomi, if you haven't listened to that before, she's someone that I love a lot, of course. And there's someone else in the program, uh, Chaplain Simon, and he's played by my husband, Sean. And again, of course, I care about him a lot. He's one of my people that I love and there he's, done different parts in different seasons, but there's a mini adventure that really focuses on Chaplain Simon, and we get to go overseas with him um, to with what he's doing over there overseas, and where he's talking to Dr. Simon on the phone, and I really like that mini. It's called My Hero, and that mini is from 2018, so if you haven't to li listen to that one, that's a good one to listen to. And by the way, there's a brand new mini adventure out today, Wednesday, April 1st. Uh, you can find it on the website. It's called The Closet Prayer, and it's a good one. It wasn't written by me. It was written by someone else. Listen to the end to find out who wrote it, but it's really, really good. So let's see, what are some of the other relationships we have in Discovery Mountain? Well, we have also another um, mom, and this time it's a son, not a daughter. It's Judah and his mom, and Judah and Gracie and their mom, Miss Michelle. They have a really, really neat relationship, don't they? Judah 
um, shared his faith in God with his mom and she started believing and being a Christian because of Judah and they moved all the way to Discovery Mountain um, all because of Judah's experience at summer camp and hmm Jake we don't know too much about Jake's family but did you know that Jake has a sister have you heard any of the mini adventures about Jake's sister anyone know her name and I'll try and watch for your comments here. Anybody remember Jake's sister's name? She hasn't visited Discovery Mountain too much, but we're gonna see a little more of her in the future. But there are a couple of minis, I think later in 2019, where she does visit Discovery Mountain. But the first time that we meet her is in one of the mini adventures from 2019, and it's called Forget Me Not. And Jake actually goes to visit her. And I think it's episode 12. So if you haven't listened to that one, if you haven't met Jake's sister, Olivia, you have to meet, meet her and listen to that one. It's a really good one. So those are some of the people who um, our characters in Discovery Mountain care about. Those are some of the people that I care about. So how have you been showing that you care about people during this time? How have you been showing love for your family members and your friends? There are a lot of different ways that we can do that, even if we can't see each other in person. And here are just a couple of ways that I've thought of that we can show our caring and our love for one another. We can make phone calls. <laughs> the phones all still work and we can phone our grandparents, our cousins, our aunts, our uncles. You know, most of us are spending time uh, just in our homes and so we all have extra time to catch up with one another, find out what's going on um, in our lives and different things that we can celebrate with each other and pray for each other. Uh, we can send text messages. That's an easy way to, to stay in touch with people we love. Another is to video conference. Um, you know, I've been doing all of my work meetings by video conference this last week and a half, or actually more. It's been more than two weeks now. And it works great for work. But you know what else it works great for? It works great with catching up with people who live far away. So the other night, we video conferenced with... Um, my kids Oma and Opa who are my husband's parents and we talked to them in BC in Canada and we got to see them and talk to them and that was really nice they're doing great and um, then last night we talked to my daughter Natalie's boyfriend on FaceTime and we got to talk to him and see how he's doing out there in North Carolina and my parents don't have a Zoom or a Skype account yet, but yesterday I helped my dad set one up and we tested it all out. And so tonight we're going to get to video conference with them. And you know, it's just really nice to be able to see the people that you love, even if it's on a screen instead of face to face, it makes a huge difference. And that's something maybe you might want to help um, your grandparents or aunts or uncles um, encourage them to set up Skype or Zoom or another way that you can actually visually communicate. Well, those are some techie ways to do it, but there's also nothing like a good old fashioned letter. <laughs> so if you have a little time on your hands and you haven't written a letter recently, I think the mail is still functioning completely normally. So maybe you might want to write a surprise letter to a friend that you normally see all the time. They could have something arrive in their mailbox. That would definitely put a smile on their face and make them feel loved and cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, again, they would love a letter in the mail. And what about writing a letter and slipping it under the bedroom door of someone you live with? I know as a mom, I would love to get a letter slipped under my door from my kids. I would still love that, even though my kids are adults. <laughs> so those are some different ways that we can show our love. And we can also think about the people maybe who, won't, who don't live with us, but are in our, our communities. Um, Think about your neighbors, reach out and, and see if, if you have to go to a grocery store, maybe you offer to pick something up for them so that not everybody has to go to the grocery store as often. Or 
if you have grandparents that live in town, um, I know my niece works at a grocery store. Two of my nieces work at a grocery store. And so now, instead of my parents having to go to the grocery store, my nieces, when they're there at work, they just pick up what my parents need and they drop it off on their doorstep. And so it's all very safe. And it means my parents don't have to go to the grocery store anymore. So there are different things like that that you can think of that you can do to show your love. And I'd love to hear your ideas. So if you're watching Watching this video live or if you're watching it um, after it's been posted to the Facebook page and you have interesting ideas of how you can show you care or, or different things that you've done go ahead and share those comments because we all could use some wonderful ideas right now to be creative with making people we care about know that they are loved all right, well, I think it's time for our story. So we are going to read again from Mary Jones and her Bible. <clears throat> Handy dandy reading glasses are back on. And we are now in chapter four. So if you are just joining us and you haven't heard the first three chapters, you might want to go back and listen to them. The book will be much more enjoyable if you've heard the other chapters. But uh, if you're just joining us and you feel like listening along, go right ahead, of course. This is the book we're reading. It's called Mary Jones and Her Bible. And it took place, this story, it's a true story that took place in Wales back in the late 1700s. And as I've shared with you, and as we're learning as we read, there's a big connection between what Mary Jones experienced in wanting a Bible for herself and why you today have a Bible or two or three or 20 Bibles at home. Why it's no longer so difficult and rare to get a Bible. A lot of it is thanks to Mary Jones. So let's pick up on chapter four. Look in the cupboard, lass, and you will see something you will like, said Jacob Jones one afternoon when Mary returned from school. Mary ran to the cupboard. Oh, my money box, she exclaimed. How pretty. Thank you, Father dear. Now I can begin to save. Oh, it rattles. There is something in it already. Remember, in our last chapter, Mary asked her father to make her a little, a little wooden box that she could save her money in so that she could save to buy her own Bible. And her dad made one for her. Oh, it rattles. There is something in it already. Only two half pennies, dear. One each from your mother and me, said Jacob. But we felt we must be the first to put something in to make a start. They sound grand, answered Mary, shaking the bright blue painted box. Thank you, mother and father. I feel rich already. She went out to the outhouse for some wood and came back with a few sticks. The sticks are all gone, she said, but it's still light enough. I will run out and gather a few. So they would have, with Mary and her family, um, would have collected sticks or wood in order to burn in their fireplace for, for warmth and for light. <clears throat> She hurried over to a healthy place where pieces of dead wood and such lay scattered around. She soon got a good bundle and was thinking of home when she heard an old woman's voice not far away. Old Mrs. Reese, thought Mary, and walked in the direction of the voice. Good evening, Mrs. Reese, she called. Is anything the matter? Can I help you? An old woman who had been stooping also to pick up sticks straightened herself and looked at Mary. Ooh, and we have another picture. Let me see here. Turning over, there are only a couple of pictures in this book, but here's one more. Here's Mary talking to Mrs. Reese. You see that picture there? <clears throat> oh, it's Mary Jones, she said. It's my rheumatism, my dear. It is so hard for me to stoop about on this rough ground to pick up sticks. Now you have a nice bundle. Could you spare half of it? I would give you a half penny for it if you would. Mary's first impulse was to give the old woman half her wood out of kindness, but she thought of her money box. That I will, she answered, and she separated a generous half of the wood from the bundle. Thank you, said Mrs. Reese. That will save me a lot of pain and trouble. And here is the half penny. If you like to bring me a bundle like this sometimes on your way to school, I will gladly give you the same for it. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Reese, cried Mary. I will. It will be no trouble. I will always do it for you. 
The old woman hobbled off, and Mary almost danced back to her home. Look, father, look, mother, she cried. I have been earning money since I went out. She took down the money box and dropped the half penny into it with a satisfying clank. Poor old Mrs. Reese is going to pay me a half penny for every bundle of wood I get her. She is so rheumatic -y that she asked me for some of mine just now. So rheumatism is a form of arthritis. So it means it hurts um, sometimes in your joints and to move and to bend. So that's what was happening to Mrs. Reese. I don't suppose she will be able to afford it very often, but it will be a half penny every now and again. What a splendid start I have made. Soon after this happened, Mary was at the farm as usual one Saturday afternoon preparing the Sunday school lesson. On this day, before tea, Mrs. Evans invited her to come out to the farmyard. I want to show you my chickens, Mary, she said. We have a fine lot this year. The fowls all gathered around Mrs. Evans as she picked her way into the yard. No, no, you greedy creature, she cried. You know you have been fed. <laughs> what a grand lot of chickens, exclaimed Mary, and such a lot of baby chicks. <laughs> yes, said Mrs. Evans. You see that big speckled one and that hen and that hen, pointing them out as she spoke. I am going to give you those for your very own. The hens will be laying soon and you can sell the eggs and do what you wish with the money. I can guess what you will do with the money now that you have set yourself the task of earning enough to buy a Bible. It will be a great bit of work and I like to think that I can be able to help you. Oh, Mrs. Evans, ma'am, I can't think what to say to thank you enough. Don't worry about that, replied Mrs. Evans. I admire you, child, for your brave spirit and wish you all success. The farm boy will bring the chickens over when he goes to market next week. Now, it's getting late, and you must have some tea before you go home. Never mind about, think about thanking me. May God bless and prosper you, my dear. Mary sped down the dusky road that evening, her feet not carrying her fast enough. She was so eager to tell her parents of this new piece of good fortune. Great was the rejoicing in the cottage that night, not only for the money value of Mrs. Evans's gift, but for her kindness in thinking of it. Everybody is so kind, said Mary. Do you know, mother, I seem to have made a lot of friends since I started to earn for my Bible. People I used to know only just a little, I know quite well now, and they are so friendly. The other day I was passing Mrs. Davies' cottage, that Mrs. Davies, who was always scolding and shouting at her children. I always hurry past if I can, but that day the smallest child was out in the road. It had gotten through the gate somehow and might have been hurt or lost. So I took the child into its mother, and Mrs. Davies was ever so kind and friendly. She said that she is nearly always feeling ill, and she worries because if she should be so ill that she had to be in bed, what would become of her children? She asked if I would come and help her sometimes. She said she would pay me. Mr. Davies is not poor. Do you think I could, mother? And hi, Brianna and Emma. I'm glad that you're listening. <laughs> You don't seem to have much time to spare, Mary dear, said Mrs. Jones, but you might give the poor woman a little help now and again, just to give her some rest. So sometimes Mary would stop at the Davies cottage on her way home from school and do a little washing or ironing or bathe the children or any other little thing to ease Mrs. Davies of her burden. And she would bring home a half penny and drop the coin, hopefully in the box. Spring was coming, and the evenings were drawing out. Now that the evenings are light, Mary, said Jacob one morning, I should like you to go to town this evening for me and take an order for some yarn. Yes, father, answered Mary. I will come back as early as I can. It will be a nice walk. I will go on from Aberginawin and walk back part way along the coast. Don't go too far out of your way, dear, said Mrs. Jones anxiously. It is a very long walk. No, mother, I will be careful, Mary assured her mother. She was not far from home and was plodding up the road when her foot kicked something heavy yet soft that was lying in the dust. Mary stooped and looked 
wondering what it was, and she picked up a leather purse, heavy and bulky. I wonder who has lost it, thought Mary as she walked on. It feels as if it is full of money. Father will know what I had better do with it. She walked on for half a mile or so, and then saw a man coming slowly towards her. He was searching every inch of the road, and then she recognized him. He was Farmer Graves, a brother-in-law of Mrs. Evans. Good evening, Mary Jones, he said. I have lost my purse. You don't, hap you don't happen by any chance. A purse, exclaimed Mary. I have just found a purse. It was lying in the road. She held the purse for Farmer Graves to see. Oh, that is my purse, he said. How fortunate that you have found it. It is getting so dark that I might not have seen it. No, indeed, answered Mary as she moved on. I should not have seen it myself, but I kicked it as I was walking. Wait, Mary Jones, called the farmer. I would like to give you something as a little reward or acknowledgement for your help. He fingered a shilling in his pocket, but he was not generous like his sister-in-law, Mrs. Evans. He found a sixpence and he gave it to Mary. There, a little gift, he said awkwardly. Thank you and good night. Mary had not expected any reward, so as a whole silver sixpence, it seemed like a treasure. It certainly lightened the last half mile of her homeward way, and as she dropped the coin into her box, she felt quite a thrill. A whole sixpence, half a shilling, she murmured. My little box hasn't got any coppers in it, hasn't got only coppers in it now. Well, the summer of that year was a very happy one. Mary was full of confidence that she would soon get her Bible. The little helps that she sometimes gave sick Mrs. Davies became known to other hard-worked mothers. Soon it was a custom for Mary to collect the small children on her way from school on fine days from a group of cottages that she passed and to sit with them amongst the heather and the bracken keeping them amused with stories from the Bible. Can't you just picture it? Mary with all the younger children who aren't old enough to go to school yet, sitting in the heather, which is a beautiful plant, and her telling them stories. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Mary would teach the children a metrical psalm and one kind of hymn that was commonly sung in those days, and the bray would sit, ring with the children's shrill voices. Then Mary would shepherd her flock back to their homes and the mothers would thank her and tell her what a help this free hour had been. And they would say, there, Mary dear, there is a little for your money box. And they would give her a half penny or perhaps only a farthing if the mother was poor. So the box grew heavy and Mary wondered how much she really had by now. I will wait until I have had it a year, she said to her mother. Then I will open the box and I will count my money. It was a great moment when Mary, her mother, and her father sitting with her at the table cut the paper that closed the little trap door at the bottom of the box and shook the money out. She placed the half pennies and the farthings in little piles and with the sixpence from Farmer Graves, she reckoned her year's savings. Eleven pence and three farthings, she said at last, and she sat looking solemnly at the little heaps of money. For the first time in that whole year, her heart failed her. Her mind went back over all the work that that money meant, and it was less than a shilling. Not quite a shilling, she said aloud, her voice trembling a little. Jacob rose from the table and went to his coat that hung on the door. He came back and put a shilling on the table, and he drew the odd change towards him. It is a shilling now, Mary, he said quietly. I think you have done wonderfully, Mary dear, said Mrs. Jones comfortingly. And you will do better still this next year, for you will be able to sell some chicks when the hens sit, and I think you might be able to get a little needlework too, for you so quite nicely now. Yes, said Mary, her spirit quickly reviving after the first downcast moment. I shall do things that pay better, but I shall do all the same old things too, she added laughing. She picked up the box. 
It is lighter, and yet it is worth more, she said. Thank you, father, dear. She ran round the table and flung her arms around her father's neck and kissed him. Jacob put an arm around her and patted her affectionately. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, it can remove mountains, he said. That cost of the Bible seemed like a mountain before you just now, didn't it, lass? But you will remove it, never fear. Yes, father, said Mary, I know I shall, for Jesus has promised it. She went up quietly to her bedroom, and she knelt by her bed, and the Holy Spirit grew strong in her as she prayed. Lord Jesus, she whispered, and she felt that she was speaking to an ever-present ally by her side. I know thou wilt, thou wilt give me strength and help. Please show me what I can do to earn my Bible soon. When she lay down at last, she was full of confidence and strong resolution. A quiet strength seemed to possess her, and she fell asleep quite happy. Earnest and faithful prayer is always answered. Only those who pray with a wavering belief doubt this, for they have no experience of true, confident prayer. Well, the next morning, Mary went to school as usual. She expected to do the usual things and to return at the end of the day to the work that Mrs. Jones was forced to leave for her to do. Mr. Ellis, the schoolmaster, was entering the school just as Mary arrived at the door. I am glad you are early, Mary, said Mr. Ellis, for I wanted to ask you if you know of any woman who could do some needlework for my wife. I suppose your mother is too busy at her weaving, but Mrs. Ellis would be glad of some help, just with plain work. I believe she has some curtains that need hemming and such like from time to time. And it came just like that, God's answer, quietly and naturally. My mother will be too busy to do the work, answered Mary, but I can do it. I will gladly do it. Her eyes shone at the wonderful opportunity. Mother was saying only last evening that I ought to be able to get some needlework to do. She says I do it quite nicely enough. Then the way opened and Mary told her teacher of her one great desire to have a Bible of her own, of the year's work of earning and saving, of her determination, and now the joyful hope that this offer of work would bring. Well, well, exclaimed Mr. Ellis. This is indeed interesting. In fact, it is wonderful. How old do you say you were? Eleven? You must surely give, we must surely give you all the help and encouragement we can. Come around to our house in the dinner hour, Mary, and Mrs. Ellis will give you some work to take home. God bless and prosper you, Mary. While the children were going into school and Mr. Ellis went in, Mary walked to her desk in a happy dream. God had answered her prayer, and so soon it was wonderful. That afternoon, Mary walked home with a large bundle in her arms. Dear me, child, called her mother when she saw her come in. What have you got there? You seem to have got some work to do at last. Yes, mother, answered Mary with a blissful smile. This very morning, Mr. Ellis told me that Mrs. Ellis needed someone to do some plain needlework and asked if I knew of anyone who could do it. I said, I could do it. Oh, mother, I prayed last night that God would show me the way to earn more and the answer came this very morning. I am so happy. I feel so close to God when he answers me like this. Have you ever had that experience? I know I have, and I feel close to God when he answers my prayers that way too. Indeed, yes, dear, replied Mrs. Jones, much moved. It is hard for us always to remember that he is so near, but he is. And I shall love the work, Mary went on, as she unrolled the curtain cloth for her mother to see. Are not the roses pretty? And Mrs. Ellis was so kind. She said it would take at least a day to hem all these pieces and that her mother used to pay her old sewing women, woman six pence a day and give her her meals. So Mrs. Ellis said that she would pay me six pence just the same, though I am very young. A whole six pence mother, isn't that grand? Jacob Jones came in just then. 
Ah, lass, he cried, are you going to make yourself a new dress? You look as fine as a butterfly. <laughs> so Jacob had to hear the whole story again, and then Mary sat down with a light heart to do her first piece of pay sewing. Wow, that's the end of chapter four. You know, I loved that chapter. There were a number of things that were really neat about that chapter. Would you agree? Um, earlier today, we were talking about ways that we can show our family members and people that we don't see all the time that we care about them. Ways that we can show love, even though we might not be able to be together face to face. And I just, in that chapter, we just read a beautiful example of how close Mary was to her mother and her father and how caring the other people in her community were to her too, weren't they? Her teacher, Mr. Ellis, um, thought of her and was kind to her. Uh, Mrs. Evans thought of her and was kind to her. And Mr. Graves, when she found his money purse, uh, he was kind to her too, wasn't he? So we can do the same in our communities. We can show each other that we care about them, even in these times where we all have to be apart physically. And Mary, uh, Mary's teacher, Mr. Ellis, because of course this is a true story. This all happened back in the 1700s in, in Wales. Um, he, he, he showed kindness and tenderness to Mary. And it made me think of the teachers in our lives. You know, our teachers are working really hard, even though they don't get to see us every day. They're working really hard to, to stay in touch with people um, digitally. And it might be nice to write a thank you note to your teacher and send it to them if you haven't already. And if you're homeschooled, well, your parents are your teachers and they would love a thank you note too. I know they would. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening for another virtual story time. So Mary Jones and her Bible, let's pick this up again tomorrow with chapter five and see how Mary is doing with earning money to put in her money box for that Bible. Thanks for joining and we'll see you again next time. Bye.